Hello to the dead and the dying. My name is TB's Guy, and uh, this video has been well requested. What's the deal with Kindred? They are equal parts yin and yang, poetry and folklore. They are a curious duality that is meant to represent twin aspects of death itself. And how does that work exactly? In fact, does it work at all? Well, that's what we're here to have a discussion about. So we're going to be taking a look at their lore, we're going to be taking a look at their character design, and we're going to be discussing somewhat their place in the world of Runeterra and how well Riot have managed to realize the ambition of a character like Kindred. Now, I've talked about Kindred before in my video about the strongest character design in League of Legends, where I said that I consider Kindred pr probably the strongest character concept in League of Legends, but I also outlined a number of my problems um, with the character itself and how well it's integrated into the world. And we're going to be repeating some of those points um, in this video. So if you feel like you heard some of it before, I apologize, but it's relevant here again. So, for the purposes of, of getting into the lore of Kindred, first we kind of have to establish Kindred's place in the cosmology of League of Legends. And this is where I am unfortunately going to have to perhaps annoy Necrit a little bit by saying that Kindred are the god of death. Or at least insofar as gods are a thing on Runeterra, Kindred is one of them. The trouble when you're talking about gods is that, especially for a Western audience, or indeed an audience that is raised in any of the Abrahamic religions, we tend to think of gods in terms of all-powerful gods, all-powerful beings. Um, which is not the only idea of what a god can be. And for me, when I think of a god like Kindred, I draw on my own background, my own cultural background in Norse mythology. And the example I like to use is that in Norse mythology, when you hear thunder in the sky and you see lightning streak across the clouds, theoretically, it is Thor being dragged in his giant cart by two mighty horned goats. And the rumble and the thunder you hear is the rumble of the wheels and the thunderclap of his uh, goats' hooves streaking sparks across the sky. And every piece of lightning is something that Thor summons from his great hammer Mjolnir as he hammers it uh, across the, the bow of his, great, uh, of his great cart. Theoretically, every time thunder happens, Thor is there, but it is also understood that Thor isn't there for every single thunderstorm that you see. He has dominion over thunder. He is the god of thunder. And if you want to have, if you want to deal with thunder, if you want to affect thunder, if you want to deal with the weather, if you want to avoid a storm, then Thor is the god to whom you will make a sacrifice. But that doesn't mean that every single thunderstorm that happens happens because of Thor, right? It's He can cause a thunderstorm to happen anytime he wants for any reason, but not every single thunderstorm that happens is directly caused by him. Sometimes thunderstorms just happen. That's sort of the, the, the concept of a god in Norse mythology is that they have dominion over a certain aspect of, of reality, but they're not necessarily all-powerful over any given aspect of reality. And similarly, it is entirely possible that Odin could summon a thunderstorm as well, if he really wanted to. It's entirely possible that some of the enemies of the gods could summon thunderstorms if they wanted to and cause Thor trouble, even though he's the god of thunder. So it's not, they're not all-powerful, but they are tremendously powerful. And they tend to, from a cultural perspective, they tend to be more about giving a name and a face to an uncontrollable aspect of reality so that you can bargain with it. Like, that's that's very much the function of gods in a lot of, of, of folklores and societies, is that these thunderstorms are a problem. We'd like them to stop. What could we possibly do that could influence the weather? Well, we could ask a god to do something about it. But as humans, we are powerless. Like, that's, that's sort of the function of gods. And that's kind of the light in which I see kindred, that they are the god of death, and when death happens, not all death is directly because Kindred is there, there making it happen, but anytime Kindred wants death to happen, they can probably cause it to happen, as evidenced by all of their abilities inside the game. And indeed, if there is a death that's interesting or important, Kindred might very well show up for it to fulfill their role as an embodiment of death. This is not to say that every single death in the, the universe of Runeterra 
um, falls under the sway of Kindred. It might be only the deaths that happen on Valoran and in Ionia, or something like that, but nonetheless, they are, insofar as a god exists on Runeterra, Kindred are the god of death. They're not just, in my view anyway, a powerful spirit that happens to associate with death. No, they are an embodiment of death, even if they're not necessarily a singular embodiment. It, maybe there's another god of death somewhere else. Maybe there are multiple gods of death, and Kindred just happens to have dominion over c certain areas, right? That's the kind of thing I'm driving at. And the concept behind them is quite interesting. Separate but never parted, Kindred represents the twin ess essences of death. Lamb's Bow offers a swift release from the mortal realm for those who accept their fate. Wolf hunts down those who run from their end, delivering violent finality with his cr within his crushing jaws. Though interpretations of Kindred's nature vary across Runeterra, every mortal must choose the true face of their death. Kindred is the white embrace of nothingness, and the gnashing of teeth in the dark. Shepherd and the butcher, poet and the primitive, they are one and both. When caught on the edge of life, louder than any trumpeting horn, it is the hammering pulse at one's throat that calls Kindred to their hunt. Stand and greet Lamb's silvered bow and her arrows will lay you down swiftly. If you refuse her, Wolf will join you for his merry hunt, where every chase runs to its brutal end. For as long as people, its people have known death, Kindred has stalked Valoran. When the final moment comes, it is said a true Demacian will turn to Lamb, taking the arrow, while through the shadowed streets of Noxus, Wolf leads the hunt. In the snows of the Freljord before going off to fight, some warbands kiss the wolf while vo V's and W's, always the trouble for Scandinavians, vowing to honor his chase with the blood of their enemies. After each harrowing, the town of Bilgewater gathers to celebrate its survivors and honor those granted a true death by Lamb and Wolf. Denying kindred is to deny the natural order of things. There are but a few wretched there are but a wretched few who have eluded these hunters. This perverse escape is no sanctuary, for it holds only a waking nightmare. Kindred waits for those locked in the undeath of the Shadow Isles, for they know all will eventually fall to Lamb's bow or Wolf's teeth. The earliest dated appearance of the Eternal Hunters is from a pair of ancient masks, carved by unknown hands into the grave sites of people long forgotten. But to this day, Lamb and Wolf remain together, and they are always kindred. That as an embodiment of death is very interesting, because certainly in the West, when we think of death, we think of the Grim Reaper. We think of the, you know, tall skeleton with the hood carrying the scythe and the deep voice, and I've come to collect you, and whatever. This sort of very particular version of death. But here we have an embodiment of two ideas of what death can be, where kindred, like where Lamb offers the respite of a quick, clean death in the sense of perhaps if you have been ill with a disease for a while, taking your final breath and exhaling, that might be Lamb that delivers that kind of blow. Or if, you're, if you are in a battle and you take a mortal wound and you decide to, you know, take the L, <laughs> accept the loss and die, Kindred is the one who releases you from the world. But if you are a desperate survivor, if you are unwilling to let go of life ever, then Wolf will hunt you down. And it, 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 it hints towards a cultural judgment, whether it is better to die um, quickly, painlessly, without a fuss, or whether it is better to struggle mightily against great terrors. It is, in fact, kind of the same question that's at the heart of Hamlet. To be or not to be, that is the question, whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fate or something, something and in so doing end them. I don't remember the exact monologue, but one of the central questions at the center of Hamlet, the play, is whether to act in order to fulfill a certain destiny or whether to be passive and accept a certain destiny. And that seems to be sort of the same question that's at the heart of Kindred, is whether it is better to gracefully accept the arrow of Lamb or whether it is better to engage in the desperate chase and to, you know, eventually be torn apart by Wolf, but at the very least to have died struggling. 
which is where we see this this um, distinction between it is said a true Demacian will turn to lamb taking the arrow while through the shadowed streets of Noxus wolf leads the hunt like and that sort of embodies the different qualities of Demacians and Noxians that a Demacian will face death with dignity like with their back straightened at the I am ready to die hit me with your arrow O oh noble one whereas with Noxus is like come and fucking get me you bastard like it's that kind of thing. And that, as a, as, a, as a central concept, that is very interesting. And I, I, it is something that I really wish Riot would have spent more time exploring after they actually released these characters. Because there's a hell of a lot to unpack there, like in terms of just the philosophy of death and the philosophy of life, whether it is nobler to struggle or whether it is nobler to accept destiny. That's, there's a lot of interesting thematic meat to dive into there, uh, that, that that I would love to see them take a part of. Unfortunately, Kindred only has two pieces of lore content <clears throat> associated with them. Excuse me if I'm slurring my words a little bit. My the, my cheeks have been hurting all day, and I don't know why. It's, I think I bit my cheeks in my sleep or something. We've got two stories. Forest for the Trees, which is a short story chronicling... It's basically laying out what happens when kindred go on the hunt for lives essentially and they they are in the middle of a battle presumably between noxians and uh, I, and demacians i don't think it's actually ever laid clear but what happens is that kindred is walking across the battlefield releasing people from suffering like they've they've been wounded they are on the field they're dying there's really nothing they can do about it and she's just basically putting them out of their misery as it were and and just killing everybody who accepts death when it when it happens to them she takes them out of the world at the same time as they get killed in the battle until eventually they come upon a squire who sees them because he's right at the edge of life and death like he's he, he's maybe going to die he's maybe going to live he sees kindred and then he has to make a decision does he accept the arrow or does he start the chase he chooses to start the chase so wolf hunts him down and just tears the life from him as he dies, finally, in, in a very brutal and unpleasant end. And it's a young squire, it's a young man, it's sort of meant to emphasize the tragedy of death on the battlefield, as it were. But ultimately, it's a pretty shallow story. It doesn't really tell us much about Kindred themselves. It's more like a literalization of some of the concepts that are being set up in the biography. And it tells us something about their relationship, like that that something I've always liked about Kindred is that Wolf is very much like a dog. Like he's a very excited dog. He wants to chase things and then he wants to tear them apart and eat them. So he's, he's, he's sort of caught in this sort of semi-comical, like he's just a little bit funny, but also just kind of terrifying because the things he finds funny tends to end with someone getting brutally murdered. Whereas Lamb is very calm, very serene, very graceful, very gentle, but also kind of scary because her idea of what gentle means is to kill people. Like, she, she just calmly arrow through your heart and now you're dead, and she's just kind of, hmm, this is wonderful, now you're going to die, boo, you're dead now. Like, that, that, that sort of very sing-songy childlike gentle girlish voice telling you that you know, yeah we're gonna kill you now you're gonna die there's a scary thing about that but the more substantial story about kindred is called a good death and it again this is why i brought up hamlet is because this story chronicles a young actress who plays the part of a person uh, in a play it it tells that it it posits that, or rather, it tells us that in, in the world of Runeterra, a certain type of play that's very popular is a death play. That is, a play that's primarily about getting to a great death scene, and sort of uh, reveling in the catharsis and the fun of seeing a really good death scene play out. Like, if you may die hard, but the whole point of the movie was to get to Hans Gruber falling off the skyscraper, essentially. And that's why I brought up Hamlet, because there is a strong element of theatricality to kindred and to the way that they are presented like it's it's something that you especially see when lamb and wolf talk all nights are good for pouncing good nights for pouncing said wolf laughing all days are too lamb said with light comes a clear shot a lot of their dialogue is written in terms of 
stage dialogue. It's like it's written as though it is meant to be spoken in a stage play. That's certainly that's certainly the feeling I get from a lot of the dialogue that they've got going on, that they are essentially a kind of death theater themselves. And so the death theater in the story is essentially a metaphor for the theater of death that Kindred put on, which is part of it. It's also Kindred relishes the hunt. Right, and Lamb likes the queen, uh, the queen, the clean, quick. That's what I was trying to say, the clean, quick kill without a, without a whole lot of fuss, the graceful death. Whereas Wolf likes the exciting, brutal death, and that too is an aspect of two different types of performance. Right, it's the difference between the high-minded, poetic sort of um, high theater, like the high art, the fancy schmancy stuff for the nobles, versus the rough and tumble, rowdy lewd plays for the low the low art and you know the, the the common audiences the vulgar plays they embody that kind of tension as well and then there's the issue of the masks which we're going to get to when we get to the character design but again masks very much a thing that's associated with theater <laughs> so there's a major theater theme going on here and it's kind of interesting to see that embody you should really read this story for yourselves it's going to be linked down in the description but essentially it it, it chronicles a young actress at two stages of her life. First, when she's young and traveling with a traveling troupe, where she walks out into the woods one night because she can't sleep, and she encounters Kindred out there. And they just kind of toy with her a little bit. They ask her some dramatic questions. They give her some... some a little bit of banter, essentially. It's what it's what's going on. They give her the opportunity to accept death, and she says that she accepts the arrow of Lamb. But it turns out they're not actually here for her. She just stumbled upon them, because they happen to be there, but Kindred aren't actually there for her, and when she comes back to the troop, to the to the, the wagons and stuff where the theater troop has been staying, everybody is dead. There's been a bandit attack, everybody has been killed rather brutally and tragically, but she alone survives. But then, some years later, she is has come to the big city, she's become a diva, a grand master of the stage playing the role of kindred and that's an that's another parallel is that she starts out playing the role of the victim the role of the person who dies in the play but then after having encountered kindred for herself she begins to play kindred on stage and she's better at it than anyone else because she's actually you know met them and that experience has profoundly inspired her and so she becomes very famous but eventually it is her last night and she gets on stage and she hears no applause, she saw no ovations. She didn't feel the stage beneath her, nor the hands of her fellow mummers in hers as they bowed low. All she felt was a sharp pain in her chest, where Kindred finally comes to claim her. And she looks out over the, over the, uh, the audience, and everybody there is either a lamb or a wolf, sort of symbolizing that, much like her, they too have chosen their fates, whether to accept the arrow of lamb, or to be torn apart by Wolf. Everybody in the audience has, has, has made that choice somehow. Which is what the story is supposed to symbolize, is that Kindred is present everywhere. Like, she's in everybody's... It, they're in everybody's minds. They're in everybody's consciousness when it comes to dealing with death. And Kindred's presence on Runeterra is so strong that the people of Runeterra make death plays. They make plays about being killed, about dying. That star kindred themselves, essentially. And that, that are about the, the theater of dying, which again is something that kindred is very much about. And from... And I've spent a lot of time talking about the lore here right now. And that's because I think the lore is a beautifully executed concept. I think it's some of the strongest that Riot has ever been when it comes to writing a believable version of folklore, a believable version of a mythical god from a culture that is unlike any of our own. This is about as good as Riot has ever been at doing that kind of thing. This is about as well put together as Riot's lore has ever been. Pity, then. Pity about the broader picture. So, insofar as character design goes, Lamb and Wolf are very simple character designs as this kind of thing goes. Wolf has to embody the 
terrifying specter of a violent death, and he does that very well. He's a, essentially a floating ghost with a giant gaping maw full of teeth um, that chases you down and tears you apart. It's a simple design, but it works very, very, very well. They emphasize the duality of the characters and the connection between the characters, the fact that they are reflections of each other, that they are part of each other, by giving each a mask that represents the other, which is, as, as visual designs go, fairly simple, very clever, and they have opposite symbols on the mask as well. Just to hammer the point home one more time, Wolf has this upside-down hook, whereas uh, Lamb has a hook shape that's turned the other way um, on their foreheads. So there's a, lot, there's a lot of work done in connecting the two characters together in that sense. Now, Lamb, unfortunately, to me, never looked that much like a lamb is the thing. Like, she looks more like a uh, satyr, as the, as the case may be for me, which is because they chose to make her bipedal and they had to make her... Essentially, she's a furry, um, <laughs> as it were. She's an anthropomorphized animal, but because we don't really get to see lamb's face at all, the connection between lamb and a real-life lamb isn't really nearly as strong as the obvious connection between wolf and a real-life wolf. And it's not... In, their character model looks better, I think, than, than the splash art presents them. But ultimately, it's a little bit tenuous. Like, I, I, I can see that she could be lamb, but equally I feel like she could also be goat, or she could also be satyr, or she could also be any number of other creatures. Like, the, there's... For me, there's a lack of features clearly identifying her as a lamb um which which where i would have given her like the things that hang down the sides of her face around the mask there those those long uh, things with some runes on them i think they're supposed to be her ears perhaps but i would have maybe given her more recognizable animal ears to sort of emphasize a little bit more same as wolf has he has very recognizable animal ears to sort of emphasize the fact that she is much more animal than she is human person because Lamb looks a little bit too much like a human in a fursuit for me. It's it's a little bit too much. Now, the bow, however, is a very effective um, tool because the bow is the quintessential tool of the hunter, like the only other one that could possibly be as, uh, as, as associated with hunting would be the spear, but that's more primitive, whereas the bow is much more refined and we need refinement for Lamb because that's what she represents is the the calm, refined, clean death, whereas Wolf is the bloody, brutal, terrible death. So the bow works perfectly fine. I like the design of the bow in that it seems it is not so much a bow that has been made by anyone so much as it kind of seems to be a bow that grew into that shape on its own and it's kind of sprouting branches off from itself almost. And I like the uh, incorporation of sort of runic, almost Celtic-like designs, especially in lamb's fur, but also in the, the design of Wolf, in that Wolf kind of looks almost like he's a giant flying curtain that's just kind of billowing behind himself. More than a cloud of smoke, he kind of looks, at least in the splash art, like a curtain dragging behind himself, which I quite enjoy. So this is where we get to the broader structural issue of Wolf and Lamb. And that is that they are not, despite all the hullabaloo, the story aspects of Lamb and Wolf make about Lamb and Wolf being, um, though interpretations of Kindred's nature vary across Runeterra, every mortal must choose the, tr the, the true face of their death, right? For as long as its people have known death, Kindred has stalked Valoran. When the final moment comes, it's set a true dimension. Like, there's all this lore work being done to establish Kindred as the embodiment of death on Rune Terror. Like, they are, there's, there may be various interpretations of them, maybe they have some different names in different places, but they are always Lamb and Wolf, and they're always together, and they are the central concept of death around which the other concepts of death on Rune Terra must revolve. And that is not really well reflected in the rest of the game, because if, if this were true, I would expect, for instance, someone like Darius to incorporate a lot more ele uh, visual elements of Wolf in his physical design. The same thing goes for, for Draven, who's an executioner. Like, you would expect him to have Wolf 
things going on with him. They're the same thing goes for someone like Vayne. Like, wolf emblems and stuff would be ideal for a character like that. Any character who deals in hunting down enemies and killing them and dealing death to them. Katarina, for example, should have much more association with the iconography of wolf. If wolf is the central concept around which especially uh, Noxian culture revolves when it comes to death. Whereas for Demacians and, and characters more on that spectrum, lamb should be much more associated with death dealing and, and sort of dignity and death and honor in battle and all that kind of stuff. You would expect to see much more of that. And that's the trouble with doing a character like Kindred. Because Kindred came along pretty late in the process. Kindred, Kindred is a relatively new character character in the 140 character strong roster and of course when kindred came out riot wasn't going to go back over all the other hundred and something characters in order to incorporate design elements from these two into every single one of those and that's kind of the issue with a game like league of legends is that you can't really design it holistically and that's the trouble if you create a character like kindred who's supposed to embody something so fundamental to all societies ever as death, like death has always, 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 across every single culture on Earth, death has always been a central concept in mythology. It has to be, because humans need a way to cope with death. It's kind of a big thing. It tends to happen, you know, exactly when you don't want it to, because nobody ever wants to die. It's a central concept in human psychology is death. The fear of death, the anticipation of death, the acceptance of death, all of these are incredibly central concepts to human society, and they're incredibly central concepts to just social structures in general. Like, think of a country like Egypt. How much of that country revolved around dealing with the legacy of death? The, the pyramids themselves were about the legacy of death. Think of Europe, where churches were community centers for hundreds upon hundreds of years because churches were where you went to go to the afterlife, which is where, you, where they are where you went to get the last rites for your corpse before you were interred, before you were buried. It was where you went for everything that had to do with death happened at the church, and the church, therefore, became a central power in European life. And the same thing goes for every other culture on Earth. If you have power over life and death, especially death, then you have power over society. And that's the trouble, is if you were gonna do this, Kindred almost has to be the first champion that you design so that their design can influence and inform the design of absolutely everything else. And Riot kind of couldn't do that. Like, I'm not really blaming them for that because how could they possibly know that back when they were first making League of Legends? They, they couldn't. But it's nonetheless still a criticism of the design. Like, it, it's still a weakness in the concept of Kindred that... Yeah they are kind of incidental to most of League of Legends. They're incidental when they should be central. And that's really, and that's why they're not my top character design in League of Legends. You have to watch that video to find out what my actual character design is, but that's the thing that's holding them back for me. That's, that's the problem with them, the thing that holds them back from being as good as they possibly could be. And I think that's about all I really have to say about them. And that ended up being almost 28 minutes. There's the last thing I want to just recognize because I know someone's going to be bringing it up in the comments. And that is this. Chiara Bautista. Um, back when Kindra was first released, there was a little bit of a kerfuffle because uh, this artist called Chiara Bautista, and I'm probably mispronouncing that, back in 2015, has a long-running fascination with a pair of characters who are, th I think, a rabbit and a wolf, as the case may be, but who share a strong visual similarity to Kindred themselves. And I'm not here to litigate that. It's possible the artist who designed Kindred took inspiration from this. It's also entirely possible that they didn't, because the lamb and the wolf is kind of a popular dual image in culture in general. Like, it's, it's a wolf in sheep's clothing is a common phrase. Like, it's, it's a common image set of imagery it's being used very commonly and the whole idea of embodying life and death and there's a sort of duality and then reforming that into a death duality like no aspect of kindred is so specific that you know it couldn't multiple people couldn't have come up with it i'm not here to litigate it i just wanted to mention that i'm aware of it that this is a thing that you should keep in mind when you deal with kindred is that riot may not have been the first people to have the idea 
Whether it was copied or not, whether it was inspired by it or not, I don't know. But Kindred is perhaps not as unique as they otherwise might seem. <sighs> anyway, thank you very much for watching. If you are so inclined, uh, I have a Patreon that you can support with whatever you're able to do. Like, if you have a dollar a month, that's very helpful for me. And you get to go, uh, you get access to the channel Discord where we hang out, we talk. Uh, there are art events being held like this is pretty much like i made the discord and now it kind of has a community of its own and people are doing like uh, writing challenges and they're doing art themes where they post art to each other and they give each other feedback and stuff and, and talk about all kinds of interesting stuff so if you want to join in on that the patreon is a great way to do that and if you don't want to do that that is of course 110 percent okay you can like this video to help me have my videos found in the youtube algorithm because that's how the youtube algorithm works is you have to click on stuff otherwise this is not just gonna bury my video for no good reason and you can subscribe which is also very helpful because then you get to see more of these videos if 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 that's if, if that's what you want to do there's also um a dislike button but once you click it you have to make a very important decision for yourself you have to make a very important decision about how you want it all to end and that decision is not reversible it's not something you can ever, ever take back. So before you touch it, be very certain that you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for watching.